Well, today we find ourselves between chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Matthew, and we've come a long way in the Lord's teaching. He has shown us how to correctly see anger, lust, vengeance, truthfulness, righteousness, and much more. And most of all, he's shown us his perspective on things. Now today, I felt led to take a week off to put all of the Lord's teaching in context by stepping way back and drawing a big picture look of time. Seeing things in this big way can help us put what Jesus is teaching us into the proper context. God has always had an eternal plan, even before he created the world. And when we see the big picture, it can help us see how the smaller choices we face daily are much clearer in the light of eternity. The entire Sermon on the Mount, as well as most of the Lord's teachings, were focused on showing us the narrow way to the kingdom of heaven. And that way begins with turning from sin and trusting in Jesus' blood for forgiveness for our past disobedience. That way continues by us making the right choices in obedience to God's word by the power of the Spirit who now lives within us. In this life that we now live, we live by trusting God and following Jesus to his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. So far in Matthew 5, Jesus has explained that those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness will gain the kingdom of heaven, that their righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees in order to enter his kingdom. And he's also told us that whoever teaches and obeys his commandments will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he's mentioned the kingdom so many times already, just in chapter 5. Then, in Matthew chapter 13, 44 through 46, Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So this is how God wants us to see the kingdom of heaven. We must desire that kingdom over everything else on earth and make difficult choices to obtain that kingdom. That is ultimately the focal point of the narrow way that leads to life. And in the end, our destiny is all about the choices we make, and our perspective determines how we will choose. That's why James wrote, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Well, with that being said, let's put on a big perspective of time and see how important each and every choice we make really is. In the beginning, God chose to create. He made the heavens and the earth. On day one, he made light and separated it from the darkness. And this is how he made day and night. On day two, he separated the water from the air and formed the sky. On day three, God separated the water and the land, and he created all of the plants on the third day. On day four, God made two lights in the heavens, the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. He also made the stars, and all of these lights in the heavens serve as signs for seasons, days, months, and years. And these are just the first four days of creation. On day five and day six, the rest of the things that God made were different than what he had made before. The creations from this point forward are described as living, and that is different. On day five, God made the sea creatures and the birds and told them to multiply and fill the earth. On day six, God made the beasts of the earth, and then his last creation he made in his own image, and that was man. Then on day seven, God rested and made the seventh day holy. Now our months are based on the phases of the moon. 
Our years are based on the rotation of the Earth around the sun, and our days are based on the Earth's rotation. But weeks are only based in one thing, this week of creation we just saw. Now, God put us in paradise, and the only thing that we had to choose to avoid was that one fruit. But we ignored his warning, and death came into the world through that one wrong choice. We actually made our first wrong choice by not believing what God had told us above the lies that the serpent said. Not only did humans make a bad choice in the garden, some angels made bad choices, and one-third of the angels followed Satan in rebellion against God. Genesis chapter 6 reveals that some of those angels had children with human women, and their offspring corrupted the earth. They filled the earth with violence, and they corrupted man who was made in God's image. Genesis 6-9 reveals how God saved mankind by saying, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So Noah was pure in his genealogy and his generations. So God saved him and his family and the animals that were uncorrupted on the ark and thereby saved us through that ark. Peter writes in 2 Peter 4, 5, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down into Tartarus and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world to the ungodly. In this way, God judged those who had made bad choices and saved those who chose to live justly and preach righteousness. After the flood, God told mankind to spread out and fill the earth in no uncertain terms, but they chose to ignore him and build a giant city to avoid spreading out. Genesis 11.9 explains that we call the city they built Babel because Babel means confusion, and that's where God confused their languages. Once they could no longer understand each other, they divided by languages and separated like God had told them to in the first place. They chose incorrectly to ignore God's instruction, and God was merciful and gave them some encouragement to obey him. 366 years later, God found a man who would obey him and teach his children to obey him, and this man's name was Abraham. God chose Abraham to be the father of a great nation and the spiritual father of all who believe and obey God like he did. James and Isaiah record that Abraham was a friend of God, and that's what God desires, fellowship with us like Adam and Eve had with him in the garden. But we must choose to live as Abraham lived to enjoy this wonderful fellowship. God always chooses the correct thing. And Abraham, although he stumbled sometimes, typically when he faced a choice, he made the right decisions. Now, Abraham's offspring did not all tend to make the right choices. And when the brothers sold Joseph into slavery, they essentially sold Israel into slavery by their bad choices. Bad choices always lead to slavery, but good and godly choices always lead to true freedom. Now, once trapped in slavery, God sent Moses to lead Israel out of their bondage. God set them free so that they could choose who they would serve, Egypt or God, darkness or light. And God did many amazing miracles and gave them their freedom through the blood of the Lamb at the Passover. So, there are only two types of choices when it comes to eternity, righteous ones and sinful ones. Righteous choices are based on God's commandments, while sinful ones violate his commandments. Sinful choices are based on short-term thinking, deception, and selfishness. We would think that no one would actually choose to disobey God and continue in sin if they could see the following things clearly, how wonderful God is, how his way is always the best and purest way, how much God really loves them, how wonderful a future God has planned for those who love and obey him, how short this life is compared to eternity, or how terrible hell will really be 
or how soon the day of judgment is coming to us all. But somehow, even when we know all these things, deception, selfishness, and a worldly perspective often guide us away from following God. But God is so kind that when he gave us his commandments, he even gave us a way to find forgiveness when we stumble away from following them. Above all, he desires fellowship with us, but we must be clean and pure to be in his presence. That's why he gave Israel the blood to make atonement for their sin. The blood was shed for the forgiveness of their sins to make them pure before him so they could fellowship with him. Now the blood never allowed them to keep on sinning or sin in his presence. And if they kept on sinning, they were judged by God and sent away in the end if they wouldn't repent. God gave them important earthly reminders through this system to help them keep a godly perspective about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now over time, the teachers twisted and misinterpreted God's commandments, and they relied on the ceremonial reminders of God's perspective instead of obedience to God. Now we see Jesus teaching against those lies so far in the Sermon on the Mount. He restates and rebuilds the moral commandments of God, filling them to the full. And the teaching of Jesus is just as important as the death of Jesus. Jesus tells us specifically, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. See, Jesus gave us the words of life, and they lead us into making the right choices and following him and God's heart. That's the context of what we've been studying in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Jesus knew that all the obedience in the world would never make up for our old lives of sin. And he gave his life to set us free from condemnation. Under Christ's blood, God can forgive our sins and grant us fellowship again. And it's through that fellowship that we have life. Adam and Eve truly died when they ate the forbidden fruit because they lost their intimate connection with God. But through the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, we have peace with God and access to him in love. We can boldly approach his throne and call him Father, all because of what Jesus did on that cross. He took the wrath that we deserve so we could have peace with God through him. And the cross is where our life with God begins. And the teachings and commandments of Jesus are how we grow and continue in that life by faith. Now, God also gave us a reason to continue and a hope to motivate us to obey him. When Jesus rose from the grave, it did many things. It showed us that he defeated death, which was the consequence of sin all the way back in the garden. It showed us that those who follow Jesus die to sin, and if they do that, they will live with him forever, just as God has promised through Paul. And it showed us that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, the Son of God, the Messiah, and the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies. Then, as if all this grace wasn't enough, God did one more amazing thing at this time in history. He sent the Holy Spirit to live within all of us who repent and put our faith in Jesus Christ. The idea that all who follow God should receive the Holy Spirit was only briefly mentioned in the Old Testament. And it is hard to imagine what a privilege this is. Only certain people received the Holy Spirit in the past, people like prophets or kings. But since the day of Pentecost, from the least to the greatest of the followers of Jesus has the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. This is a tremendous gift, but also a great responsibility, which is why Paul taught us that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit and we must not commit sin with our bodies. To whom much is given, much is required, and we can now grieve the Spirit, quench the Spirit, or sin against the Spirit. So along with joy and peace, we must have reverence for God and His Holy Spirit who empowers us to live now for Jesus. Now, we're going to skip the time between 31 AD and 2014, and we're going to head to the future. 
The next giant event we should definitely be looking for in the near future is what Jesus and Daniel call the abomination of desolation. The Bible is clear that this next event must occur before the return of Jesus to this earth. And this is the event. The man of lawlessness, we call the Antichrist, will be revealed. He'll agree to a covenant, and then he will oppose every so-called God and claim to be higher than them all. He will even take a seat in the temple of the one true and living God. Because we know that this must take place before the day of the Lord when Jesus returns, we're also looking for a temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And because of these prophecies, we know that there will be a mark of the beast that you will need to buy or sell in the future. And if you take this mark, you are definitely going to hell, no questions asked. Now, after the Antichrist commits the abomination that causes desolation, a countdown of three and a half years begins, which is the time of great tribulation. At the end of this period, on a day and hour that no one knows, Jesus will return in the clouds just like he was taken up. At this time, those who have died following Jesus will be resurrected, and those who are alive and following him will be raptured, and we will all go to meet him in the air, most likely above Jerusalem. This is when all those who are raptured and resurrected will receive their eternal perfected bodies, just like Jesus received at his resurrection. Then, Jesus will descend to the Mount of Olives and split it in two, allowing those who just saw him drive and now believe on him to flee from the city, while the Antichrist prepares to fight the Lord in the Valley of Megiddo. We call this battle the Battle of Armageddon. With one word, Jesus will destroy those armies, and the Antichrist and his lying sidekick called the false prophet, who caused so many to worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast, both of them will be thrown into hell at this time. And this begins a period of a thousand years called the millennium, when Jesus and his resurrected saints will rule the earth and peace and justice will be the law of the land. This period is like a thousand year Sabbath or rest for the earth while Satan is locked up for this thousand year period. The lion will lay down with the lamb and every nation will come during the Feast of Tabernacles to worship Jesus and bring offerings to him. He will be the king of all earthly kings and the Lord of all lords. And if any nation doesn't come up during this Feast of Tabernacles, no rain will fall on them as a punishment for their disobedience. During this period, any who didn't fight in the battle of Armageddon or take the mark of the beast will be allowed to live on the earth under the leadership of the resurrected saints and ultimately Jesus himself. At the end of the millennium, Satan will be allowed free one more time to deceive the remaining people who are not yet resurrected and many will follow him to surround the city of Jesus, but fire will fall from heaven and destroy them all and then Satan, death, and Hades will be cast into hell for all eternity, and every person who is left will be judged and either resurrected to eternal life or eternal punishment. And when this judgment is over, there will not be one person left on earth who doesn't love and obey Jesus Christ. And all people will be resurrected to perfection forever. Once all things are subjected to Jesus, Jesus will then welcome the Father, and they will remake the heavens and the earth in front of us all. Then the city of God will descend to earth, and the new heavenly Jerusalem will be with us for the rest of eternity. This city is the Holy of Holies, and it's where the Father and the Son will dwell with us forever. The gates will never be closed, and there will no longer be any night at all. We will be able to approach God, and live in his light forever and ever as we sing to his glory of all that he has done. God himself will be our reward, and there is joy in his presence forevermore. So now, if we pull back farther, we can see all of this on a timeline. We saw creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the commandments, 
the teachings and cross of our Lord and Savior, the sending of the Holy Spirit, and today's present day. All of this, on one little timeline, our life wouldn't even look like a little line on that. That's how short, and that's the perspective we need to keep in mind as we go throughout our life. Also, the Bible gives us the certain future that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with the many for a seven-year period. Then three and a half years will pass, and at that time he will stand in the temple and proclaim himself to be God. Then three and a half more years will pass, and it's called the Great Tribulation. Then Jesus will return and destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming, and this is the time of the first resurrection when anyone who has died and all those who are alive and following Jesus will be perfected forever in a glorified body. Then a thousand years of peace will take place, and at the end, Satan will come out, be allowed one more time on this earth, and he'll lead some of those who haven't been perfected and resurrected astray, only to be thrown into hell for eternity with him. Then the second resurrection takes place at this time, and all the ungodly from all time are eternally judged. Once all wickedness is removed from the earth, God remakes the earth and descends to forever live with us in perfect peace, righteousness, and love. So we're going to close with two encouraging passages. First from Romans 13, which says, And do this knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And finally, in James 4.14, he writes, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, all of this could unfold tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Our time on this earth, compared to eternity, is so short. So no matter what we're facing, it's nothing compared to the vastness of eternity. Our trials look like temporary light afflictions in the light of His glorious grace. 